so um, let me share my screen and maybe give me a head nod if those if that screen is there we go head nod um this is stewart lake county park um on this intro slide we got some pictures of some walnut logs being uh staged there for some milling with our local high school uh partners that Mary Sutter has um, set up, and those logs are now boards um, in the school as opposed to being firewood or burnt up. Um, so we've been removing some um, native trees to help expand the oak savanna there. Um, and then there's another nice scenery shot of uh, our native grasses coming in underneath the oak canopy, still more thinning to do. Uh, to get the oaks more freed up, make it more of a savanna structure, but we're on our way. Um, for those folks that aren't too familiar with Stewart Lake, um, we're right on the edge of Mount Horeb, uh, out in the western part of Dane County, on the edge of the Driftless area. Um, it was our first county park in the park system established in 1935, the very first. 191 acres, um, Moen Creek sort of originates up in Stewart Lake on the north side of Mount Horeb and then runs through some nice quality wetlands into Stewart Lake and impoundment. Um, with nice beach fishing, ice fishing, uh, ice skating, um, and then continues to drain past the impoundment. Um, a whole variety of different oak communities, prairie, prairie restorations, um, and of course there on the edge of the Driftless with views of uh, Blue Mounds itself. So uh, check it out if you are in the area. Here's a little summary of some of the restoration work that's occurring there. Again, Paul, Mary, Jack, Mike, are the main driving forces out there doing this wonderful work. Uh, the Oak Trail is probably the, the longest standing uh, restoration area where volunteers have been working. Uh, previously, uh, Don Schlub had worked in starting to clear this area out. He, he hasn't been quite as active lately, but has been one of the, the main um, volunteers that really started some of this work. Uh, it's a nice southwest facing woodland savanna complex on those driftless hillsides. This is the woods or, or woodland last winter. And of course, Mike and Paul haul and brush over to burn piles. A lot of vegetation brush has been removed, base of species to clear out around these big, nice uh, burr oaks for the most part. Um, seeding has come in, uh, thanks to the volunteers, uh, seeds have been scattered throughout this area, focusing mostly on getting native grasses rise established as a way to get some fuel going underneath the oak so that the area could be burned. Um, surprisingly, there's just not a lot of leaf litter in there. Um, the oak litter helps with the fire, but we just want to get some more fuel developed so we can burn the site. Uh, it's our most important tool that we have, uh, most efficient tool, most effective in a lot of ways. So we got to get fire going in there to really um, get this restoration kicked into high gear. Um, sure enough, uh, a lot of those grasses are starting to come in. Here's another, another picture of some rye growing, Canada wild rye, bottle brush grass, little blue stem in the sunnier areas have really developed. Um, there's some nice um, dead oak snags that we're trying to keep as much as possible uh, as red-headed woodpecker habitat. Um, dead trees are very important to have in our savannas, woodlands. So uh, I don't know how many red-headed woodpeckers you have there now, but there's certainly um, at least one nesting pair. And it seems like the population has, has grown quite a bit um, in abundance since the restoration um, has started a few years ago. We got one decent-ish fire maybe a year and a half ago, springtime um, in there. Uh, but this this last year, we weren't able to get a burn. Uh, very hard to, to get a burn in this uh, park in some areas, unfortunately, because of the surrounding 
um, village and in uh, housing communities. So um, need the right wind direction. Um, and then uh, I want to mention the Bluebird Project. So Jack is the the leader of, of this effort um, to get more bluebirds established. They're an oak savanna species. They love the openness of the savannas, open woodlands. And here's us at Earth Day event with Operation Fresh Start, putting in some bluebird boxes and Jack carefully um, uh, manages and monitors the bluebird production in these areas. And I think these uh, open savanna woodland areas where brush and trees have been removed are, are pretty productive as far as uh, bluebirds go. So um, moving on to another area that Jack is uh, very active in along with the Operation Fresh Start is the, the, the remnant prairie that exists in one of these southwest um, hilltops, steep hilltops, uh, goat prairie. Um, so in the, the distance there, we're standing in a wetland, but in the distance, there's a hilltop uh, where there is a maybe a quarter acre of remnant prairie vegetation that was um, never planted, just still original prairie, very rare nowadays. There's a lot of nice um, uh, natives, prairie um, needlegrass, hoary pacoon, blue-eyed grass, sky blue aster, little blue stem, uh, still persisting where the trees and the shrubs hadn't swallowed it up and shaded it out. So uh, Jack and volunteers and Operation Fresh Start have been clearing open this, um, this hilltop, getting those oaks exposed, and then getting that um, prairie side uh, a dose of sunlight and some, some fire as well as they've um, been able to secure a couple of grants to have the contractor burn that uh, the last couple of years. Uh, so it's really starting to pop. Um, in the future, we hope that clearing continues further in both directions, actually meets down with the Oak Trail to the south and then to the north overlooking uh, the lake. And then um, the wetland, as I mentioned, Moen Creek originates in Stewart Lake County Park, and there's a nice um, wetland community, skunk cabbage in the spring, sedges, uh, Joe Pieweed here in this picture, Bowen Set, and there's some trails that run through there, lovely trails, and um, volunteers, fresh start um, staff have worked to keep the brush at bay in there. Um, doing some planting of swamp white oaks and uh, some weed work as well. Although uh, the oak trail and the remnants is really where most of that focus of work has, has occurred. Uh, last but not least, the, the rain garden. Uh, as stormwater comes down through those steep hills, through the village, along the roads, it enters into Stewart Lake. And this rain garden here functions to slow that water down, let it settle out. Um, nutrients get deposited and um, keeps the rain uh, stormwater a little uh, cleaner as it enters into to the lake. So a um, lot, lot of hours have been put in there. Um, Mary and Paul, especially growing plants, putting plants in, watering plants, having school groups, scout groups, um, other volunteers come. Operation Fresh Start to to help with weeding, watering, maintenance. It's been really unbelievable. Um, they continue to expand it. That little cube in the background is a, a water cube uh, that they use for for irrigating their plants, especially this year where it's been so so dang dry. And then when it's raining, there's a just torrent of water that comes down there, and uh, as Mary says, leaves a debris field of uh, junk in the grass that they've got to. <laughs> that they've got to uh, clean up. So um, on the right, we actually saw uh, Rusty Patch Bumblebee be using the rain garden a couple of years ago, and it's been documented several times. The species uh, federally endangered, I believe, um, at Stewart Lake uh, County Park in a number of locations. In the background, you can kind of see that bald hilltop of the, the remnant prairie and then a, an older restoration in, in the background. Um, there's a just a ton of work occurring out here in a lot of different work areas. And this just kind of skims the surface of everything that's occurring out there. So um, I, I really didn't do anything uh, too well of a service by, by going this fast through it. But 
Um, I, I want to just take some time and acknowledge all the great work that's occurring out there and um, really applaud them, the volunteers for, for all the work, Mary, Paul, Jack, Mike, and others. Um, it's really turning this park around in a dramatic way. I, I, uh, I, I, I think I have said a few times that Stewart Lake, um, unfortunately, I don't know why exactly, but it's it's one of the parks with the most um, weeds. And I'm not sure how that could be, but um, these volunteers are really turning it around and, and making these project areas shine. So um, Jack, Mary, Paul, Mike, Mike's not here, but anything you want to add? Um, we just have a couple of minutes, but... Um, the stage is yours if you have anything to say. I think um, I'd say that I've learned my lesson about taking on too many plantings. Jack warned me about this several years ago. We shouldn't be gardening. We should be operating on a landscape scale. And I have heard that voice in my head just about daily since uh, mid-May. Um, but I do think that getting engaged with the planting has taught me more about plants than I would otherwise know. Um, and it's also given us an opportunity to interact with school groups. And, uh, you know, at times when we wouldn't have other things for them to do. And as Operation Fresh Start comes uh it is bringing in younger volunteers or younger crew members. Um, we struggle if they can't they can't use power equipment and they can't use herbicide. You know the sometimes the planting um, has been has been a good thing to engage them with because we can you know we harvest some of our own seed so they can clean seed and they can work on stratification. Um, they can work on transplanting at times when uh, there isn't there isn't other things that they that especially the younger folks can do. So um, I'm looking forward to the switch of seasons where we can take some of the grass seed from our native or from our our um, all of our past seeding and scatter it into newly opened areas. But I have questions about the timing of that. Um, so, and I bet that will be part of a bigger discussion for everybody is, you know, um, when can we, when, when, when is it the best time to harvest and then re-spread the seed so we can get it in contact with open soil before the leaf litter, um, descends from the, the, the oaks. We kind of want it underneath, I think, because if we do get a chance to burn that the savanna, the opening next year, we'd like to have the seed have have had contact with the soil, I think, but that's that's all I can say. Uh, I'll, that's what's on my mind, I guess. Jack, maybe you have other comments. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. No, I have no other comments. Um, Laura's really covered um the work in the park really well um that's all yeah excellent thanks jack um it's kind of interesting to see what other parks are doing and their projects and their approaches and all that so um like to show off their work but also just share with other volunteers um, what's going on how people do things what kind of work they're involved in. And I think that there's good value in just spotlighting these different uh, parks for that reason. So thanks for, thanks for being on stage, Stuart Lake. And uh, we will continue moving along here. Um, upcoming training opportunities. So Claire's got some more precise dates on our chainsaw training classes, level one and level two. You can see those October and November dates uh, listed right there. Uh, certified land steward training is occurring uh, Thursday, October 19th. And then our wildfire slash prescribed fire training hosted by the Wisconsin DNR, Ralph Sheffer, uh, full day class 
uh, sort of a compressed version of the uh, federal S-130, S-190 course. Uh, that is November 14th. Uh, so if you know anyone or, or if you know that you, you would like to be in one of these classes, um, please uh, register on our events page or let Claire know, uh, ask us any questions you have about these, these various trainings. So we'll continue to keep this as a running slide every coffee hour so that folks know of upcoming training opportunities. Um, other than these, uh, we are always doing training at our work days. So coming up, we're gonna have a whole lot of uh, seed collection work days and processing. Uh, those in August should be posted currently on our events page. And then come September and October, we're gonna be going you know, two, three times a week, um, two places each day you can choose from. And those will be going all through the fall with processing sprinkled in. So. Uh, come check those out as well. And uh, moving on yet again, we're going to go into the section where we talk about uh, various weeds that we're working on. So timing is crucial for combating these summertime invasive species. And um, we're getting towards the end of weed season here. Uh, which means if you're going to do some weed work, you better do it quick because right now uh, seeds are ripening, starting to fall. There's still time for certain things. You've run out of time for other things. Uh, you might need to bag seeds that are on the plant, which is not fun to do on a large scale, but it's an option, um, especially for smaller populations. Uh, we're going to talk about white sweet clover, I think last time we had this presentation, I said it for, for some reason on the slide that it was a perennial and it's not, it's a biennial. Starts out as a little um, cluster of uh, leaves and short stems that first year, doesn't flower at all that first year. And then the second year, um, it uses its stored energy to, to bolt uh, several sort of spikes of white flowers all over the plant. Uh, to my left here is a picture from yesterday. Those little white pea flowers on that spike are developing into these green little um, legume beans. So at this stage, you can see those beans are swelling. Um, the flowers are nearly gone and those seeds are potentially getting ripe. So at this time of year with white sweet clover, um, unless something funky happened where it, where it got mowed off early and it's just reflowering and in full bloom right now, um, they're gonna have a likely ripe seeds on them that you should bag. This plant that I have in front of me was in the shade. So it's even a little bit further behind in its phenology than plants that are in full sun. Uh, full sun is almost always gonna give you plants that are gonna be further advanced. Drier sites as well are gonna be further advanced. Um, so even in this shady site, we've got uh, little legumes forming um, in front of my hand there that need to be bagged up. Um, questions on white sweet clover before I move on? All right, we can always go back if you have any. Um, here is a big one, and it's been a big year for this species, Japanese hedge parsley. Um, I know many people on this call have been working on this plant, um, especially at Stewart Lake, just ferociously this whole year. Uh, we, we try to work as smart as we can instead of working as hard as we can. So um, knowing your enemy is very important, um, knowing what you're up against. Um, this is uh, a species in the carrot family, produces little white umbels um, of flowers, just like Queen Anne's lace, which is closely related in that same family and has umbels of flowers as well. The only difference in that flower is that these are much smaller, smaller flowers compared to Queen Anne's lace, which are a pretty darn big flower. 
Um, there are more flowers per plant on Japanese hedge parsley, kind of scattered all over that plant, like ornaments on a Christmas tree, just everywhere. Grows more in your shaded spots, kind of uh, a little bit of dappled shade. It's just perfect for hedge parsley. It loves our oak woodlands. It's got sort of a fern-like leaf on the right there of the screen. And then the stem takes a lot of turns or sort of zigzags going from the ground all the way up to the top where the flowers are. Um, right now, this is what the seeds look like on the left. August 8th, that was yesterday in, in my neighborhood there, grows in people's gardens. Um, and the flowers are pretty much all off in the sunny locations and probably mostly gone in the shady locations as well. Um, the flowers were going to be replaced by these little bristly seeds that are spread on your shoelaces and fleece jackets and your dog's fur all around. And that's where we find them is along the trail sides being spread by park users and mowers. Um, and uh, as they ripen, they turn from a greenish coloration in, in the beginning. Can you guys see my um, cursor? Uh, yep, I see some head nods. So they're sort of greenish at the beginning and then they become darker brown. So on the same plant, we've got a darker brown uh, cluster of seeds. And as they become darker brown, they ripen um, and then they become viable. If you catch the plant early enough when it's got green seeds, probably maybe even has a couple of white flowers hanging on, those green seeds will crush in your palm of your hand and just um, turn to, uh, to gunk, <laughs> just to mush. And there's no resistance when you press on them. They don't feel gravelly like a viable seed does. They're just full of water and they kind of crush and dissolve away in your hands. So when they're green like that, they're not likely viable. Uh, when they turn brown, like my cursor on the top here um, is, sh is showing this cluster here, that's when they start to become viable. So you, you put that in the palm of your hand, you crush it, it gives you resistance, it feels kind of gravelly. It doesn't um, kind of turn to mush, watery mush. Um, that is going to tell you it's time to bag that that seed, time to bag that plant. Um, if you are in a situation where you've got a lot of plants that are sort of on the cusp of green or brown, you'll have to make a decision. Do I spend all this time bagging them all up or do I just try to work as fast as I can and cut them all down and reduce the number of viable seeds that hit the soil? Bagging is a lot of work. It's a pain in the butt. Uh, we like to try to do as much work as we can on the front end before we get to the stage and we've got a bag. Every once in a while, you'll find a few plants uh, that slip through the cracks and they're, they're worth bagging. Um, the perfect time to, um, to be mowing the species is maybe like the last couple weeks before um, the seeds go from this green to brown and there's maybe even a few blooms left on the plant. You'll get no, no re-sprouting. And even before that, when the plant is in full bloom and you mow it, we've had very little re-sprouting. Um, that's one good thing about the species. It's, it's pretty wimpy when you start beating up on it. It doesn't like um, to be mowed. It hates being burned. It hates prescribed fire um it, it a lot of herbicides will take care of it so it's susceptible to a lot of things as long as you um keep on top of it for a few years uh once once you uh have started working on the population if you keep on it for three or four years it's kind of like parsnip which is in the same family where the seeds um don't stay viable in the soil for very long we're finding that they very um, soon runs out of seeds in the soil. They either germinate or they rot, and you can get ahead of the population in, in a few years, just like parsnip. So one characteristic is probably 
um, across that whole family, uh, the carrot family of plants. Unlike legumes or other hard seeded species that can live there for, for decades. So uh, I talked there for a long time. Do folks have questions about um, hedge parsley at all? Comments, war stories? <laughs> Mary and Paul. <laughs> okay. Um, so great Sorry. work at Stuart. Yeah, Liz. Yeah, uh, just a question. If, do you need to, if only part of the plant or you just see one bit that's formed ground seeds, do you have to bag the whole plant or can you just clip off the, the part with the brown seeds? Yeah, good question. I mean, theoretically, just the part with the brown seeds and then let the rest of the plant lay. Um, but it can be kind of a pain to sort of look closely at that whole plant with all the blooms covering the whole plant, um, you know, to inspect them all to see, you know, if they're viable or not. So a lot of times people just bag the whole plant just for simplicity um, and it's almost just as fast. So not taking any chances and nothing slips through your cracks. So uh, does that answer your question? All right, moving on, we can always circle back. Spotted knapweed. Um, this is a species that grows in our sandier, droughty soils. Um, it loves that kind of desert-like environment in, in Wisconsin. So we have it in uh, walking iron, sandy terraces out there by the Wisconsin River. It's all over central Wisconsin, but uh, you can certainly have it um, in sandy, gravelly places um, at, at your park. It would grow well at the remnant at Stewart Lake County Park and at hilltops. Uh, it's a perennial, unlike a lot of our weeds that are biennials, this one will come back. So if it's mowed, for fl while flowering, you might think, okay, great, I've prevented it from seeding and I've hurt it because it was flowering when I cut it, but uh, you didn't kill it. it. It'll come back from the roots. Um, so here's a picture on the left from yesterday. You'll see that the blooms come in a whole variety of stages. Um, with hedge parsley, they're, they're pretty close to each other. Um, some will be flowering and maybe some will be in the seeding um, uh, stage. But here, knapweed, the plant in the background, the, 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 um, the bud in the background is a flower that hasn't even opened yet. Here in the foreground, we've got a full blooming flower. And then here, lower left, we've got a flower that has been pollinated and is already releasing or released seeds. So you have all stages on this one plant here. Um, so as soon as you start seeing it bloom, it's probably wise to, to bag it up, especially if you get later in the year when you could start getting uh, these fluffy dandelion-like seeds um, scattering, scattering around in your prairie. Um, again, it's, it's mostly restricted to like sandier sites, whoops, sandier sites, droughty hilltops, but it's a perennial, it's, it's nasty. Um, it, it could, um, really take over your site. Donald is a very ripe fertile ground for spotted knapweed. Um, it's very important to get ahead of this one, uh, nip it, uh, soon instead of waiting. Uh, because once it seeds into your site, it is hard to get out as we're seeing at walking iron. The seed longevity is a lot longer than the parsley family, parsnips and hedge parsley. Um, I said they only last, you know, four years in the soil. Well, we've been managing this one like crazy at walking iron, uh, pretty much preventing it from releasing any new seeds each year for the last four or five years and we're still getting a lot of it coming up. Uh, so not one you wanna mess with if you see it um, important to get on it early. Questions about spotted knapweed? Kind of a bluish green, maybe silvery foliage. Do you, do you spray it, Lars? 
Yeah, yeah, you can spray it. Um, we, we use Milestone on this one also, just like we use on Crown Vetch. It's in the Aster family. Yeah, pretty widespread in the Great Plains out west. There's a few other non-native knapweeds as well. But this is the one we deal with the most. Yeah, we'll get on top of it early. It looks like little thistle flowers in a way. No spikes, uh, no spiky foliage. When is the most effective time to spray? If you're going to spray, you're going to want to do it before you've got seed production um, so that you can really maximize your success, your control. Um, so you could go out there and spray right now, but there's seeds flying around and it's like, ah, oh, boy, um, it'll, it'll kill the mother plant. Um, it's a perennial, so you'll kill that mother plant. Um, but really, you, you're going to want to be spraying it maybe a, at least a month earlier than we are right now. Um, so early July, you know, um, be out there early before it really starts flowering and then quickly seeding. Um, so milestones, your ticket, uh, at least get there by early July, if not sooner. You can spray it before it's flowering. So what did you do with the plant that you took a picture of? Did you pull it? Uh, yeah, it was just probably pulled. I wasn't there. This was someone else. That oh, okay. Photo, but this was during our walking in our work day yesterday. It was pulled and bagged. Um, and uh, Shane just said, uh, the parsnip predator is a great tool for this plant. And it's tap rooted. So just get the crown out. And, um, and you're good. It's not like garlic mustard that's going to reroot. It'll just, you know, as long as you don't have viable seeds being produced, um, you can just let it lay. It's a good one to just hand pull, hand dig, and then those sandy soils, uh, you know, it comes out fairly well. I was just going to say for um, parsnip predators, they're now, you can pick them up in Madison. Previously, you either had to go to Baroqua to get them or have them shipped from Baroqua. But as of like three weeks ago, you can now get them at um two ferns nursery which is kind of over off of milwaukee street so oh. it's amy joe dusak's business partner Al althina Al aldina I, I don't know how to say her name but everybody if i say amy joe's business partner they know who that is so you still go to tpe's website to order them and pay for them but you can pick them up in madison that's a great tip um robin i didn't know that and that was always one thing is the shipping charges for those are pretty hefty so we like to buy a lot of them every year and they usually get used and disappear and um i think they're they're always we're always needing to buy more so great great tip on that other questions about napweed cool um, so this is sort of new weeds that we haven't talked about in previous um, coffee hours. Um, I got knotweed, Phragmites, and Miscanthus silver amergrass. Um, and these are maybe slightly lesser known species compared to hedge parsley and sweet clover and, and garlic mustard, but there's species that are becoming more abundant in our area for sure. Um, they are pretty abundant in other parts of the country and uh, we're seeing more and more of them in our parks. So they're good to know about um, and get on very early before they become too problematic because they can become very hard to manage. Um, this first one is not weed. Um, it's sort of a shrubby, um, bushy plant, perennial, that um, has these pretty little feathery flowers that grow up and down um, their stems. It can probably get to be about you know, eight, 10 feet tall. And um, on the right here, you'll see there's some plants growing out of someone's foundation. Uh, they are extremely tough and resilient. Um, when you try to manage them, they come back 
just as bad as they they were when they started it seems um and um, they can actually damage your foundation of your house um, if you leave it unmanaged um, for for too long with those roots that go way down deep um, which you might think is a great thing for holding soil and i suspect people have planted it for holding soil um, however it doesn't have much of any of the fibrous roots so when you get it along stream banks it grows down deep but then it doesn't have any of the the small fibrous roots that capture the soil and when there's flooding and uh, force applied to that stream bank um, the stream bank erodes and, and washes away um, which is interesting I think in Madison, you're required to control knotweed since it can be so problematic to um, foundations and then creep into your neighbor's yard and tunnel down and, and create cracks in their foundation as well. So um, that is what I've heard is that you're, you're required to manage it. Um, here in the lower picture, there's Kathy Peasy's vehicle at Lower Mud Lake with a thicket of not weed behind it um, and then behind that are these big beautiful oak and hickory trees that we freed up um, so that patch there we are still working on maybe five four or five years later it doesn't look anything like that anymore um, but it is still coming back and it, it's gonna probably turn into that thicket again if we don't do anything um, we've, uh, started to use a method where we mow it down during the summer repeatedly. And then, um, in the fall, like late summer, fall coming up here in the next few weeks, we treat it with milestone. And then as the, um, uh, liquids inside the plants, the nutrients, the water are kind of going more in the downward direction for fall. It carries that herbicide with it. Um, better allocates it down into the roots and and seems to be better control. Um, that's the advice we've heard from um, other folks who've worked on it longer than us. If you go to New England or out to Washington State, you'll see the species all over the place. Um, waterways, it's very abundant out there, and it could very well get to be that way here too as as well. So. Uh, definitely one uh, to look out for. Kind of has almost like a almost like a bamboo look, but it kind of curves over, and then the stems are sort of fragile, hollow looking, kind of unique in all um, in all ways. Uh, but it's it's definitely um, coming this direction. Problematic. Any questions on this one? All right. Another species, Phragmites or giant reed grass. Um, this is very common along the Lake Michigan shore from Chicago up to Milwaukee, Fox River Valley, all the way up to Green Bay. It seems to be very common in those areas. It's a thick, dense, tall perennial grass with these beautiful tassels on top. Uh, we do have a native Phragmites. It's not nearly as tall and thick and dense and um, robust as this one, but they can get confused sometimes. Nine times out of 10, it's gonna be the non-native. Uh, it's got very, uh, I would say this one more than the other is, is kind of got a bamboo look to it. Uh, big, broad grass-like leaves that come out of the, the sides of the stems and then the showy tassel on top that's very, very big, uh, tend to stay up all, all winter long. Um, you know, people think they're pretty, they carry them around, take pictures of them, put them in flower arrangements. Um, I don't know how viable a lot of the seeds are, definitely spreads, spreads through seed as well as um, vigorously through the root system. Um, and it grows in wetland environments. Um, if you go to Chicago or Milwaukee on the weekend and you, you take a look, um, it is just everywhere down there. And it really stands out in the fall and the winter with those tassels on top. Wet soils and um, it, it 
it certainly is traveling this direction. We have it, we've had it for a little while, but it hasn't gotten quite nearly as bad. Um, this is also one that that is um, best managed with a fall, late summer or fall application of herbicide. And so we have various um, herbicides that we use uh, this time of year to treat it. Um, they get down in the root system and have some uh, carryover in the soil. It's not like one and done. It requires follow-up, um, but it is managed. The tricky part about it is that it grows in these wetter areas that are hard to get to a lot of times, uh, hard to access, hard, hard to do any work when you're slapping mosquitoes and, and sinking into the mud. Um, and then uh, for aquatic sites that are truly in standing water, uh, it needs you need a wetland um, permit and aquatic certification. Uh, to treat in these areas, which we can arrange if you happen to have some at your park. Uh, Donald has a few small patches coming in that we've started to treat there, Liz, along Highway 92. Um, Stewart Lake, I'm not so sure about. Mary and, and Paul and Jack, you guys might want to take a look to see if you have any of this stuff around your lake or wetland there. Um, and certain other parks scattered around, small patches, uh, don't even bother looking at the belt line um, <laughs> as you go over our Nine Springs E-Way because it looks a little bit like Chicago in a way down there. Maybe not quite as bad, but it's very common um, in the Nine Springs area. We'll displace reed canary grass um, and all that stuff that's pretty competitive. So questions about Phragmites? All right, here's one I don't know if many people know about quite yet. Uh, maybe raise your hands or uh, shout if you if you recognize this as you drive down the roadsides. This is Miscanthus amargrass. You recognize this, Mary? Okay. Yeah, so it's kind of a decorative um, ornamental grass. Um, in the fall, it starts to turn kind of a beautiful reddish foliage, and then the the inflorescence the seeds on top catch the light very pretty silvery kind of look shiny grass it grows in in ditches along the roads here we've got plenty of it um, up around the edge of our highways near our parks we've got some of it encroaching our parks um, it's a pretty tough uh, species to kill um, just your normal dosage of, of roundup or glyphosate doesn't usually even touch this grass. It must have a really vigorous root system. Uh, we use the same product that we use on giant reed grass, Phragmites, the uh, Polaris, um, that gets down into the root system and has some carryover in the soil and needs to be applied uh, sort of this time of year, late, late um, summer into fall. Um, I've seen some patches start out pretty small on the highway. I don't think they spread too readily by seed, but they have to, to some point, spread by seed to get around. Uh, they really spread underground through the root system. So those little, those little patches that just started out, eventually they'll grow into something like this, where they just keep going laterally down the road in either direction along the ditch line. And pretty soon you've got this huge clone of, uh, uh, miscanthus uh, still used i think in in the um, landscaping i can see why it's very really, very pretty um, but it is uh, a difficult one to contend with uh, okay robin we'll see you thanks for uh joining us today and uh, yeah you can check throughout the rest of the recording um all right questions on miscanthus Lars, did you say that Tom is going to be treating that across the county and we should just oh, let yeah. you know? Yeah, I forgot that you have it at, at Stewart. Um, yeah. Lucky you. Okay, so what I was thinking, Tom, are you still in the room? Tom's gone right now. Yeah, what I was thinking is we have a bunch of small patches throughout the county and it probably doesn't pay for you to mix up one gallon 
for this and to make sure you have that right herbicide and all that. So I think Tom can do a circuit and just treat these small patches throughout the park system and he'll just hit Stuart along the way. Okay. Yeah. So we should kind of scan through and see if it's in other places um, or do you want to just like in our most active work areas or, you know, we can pretty much see all the areas from the trails at Stewart, but I never know, like, is this a work area or is it? Uh, yeah. So I, I think this one we want to do everywhere because okay. it has such a potential to dominate. And we really want to get these new infestations um, eradicated quick. So um, we'll hit the areas below the Oak Trail in that sort of basin uh, that we know about above the Oak Trail a little bit. Uh, but if you happen to know of any other patches or Don maybe knows of any patches park system park wide, um, we'll hit those two just to keep them from becoming like like this here. Um, we have our focused work restoration areas, but when it comes to sort of these targeted um, weed control efforts, you know, not weed coming in, uh, Phragmites coming in or Miscanthus, you know, we really want to get on top of those ones quick. So we'll work outside of our targeted restoration areas for, for stuff like that. Uh, Lars? Yeah. Um there there is some i believe there was at one time um below the mcnall house at the end of viking in that area um there's also a hell of a patch of reed canary grass there too but i don't know if um we we tend to see it because people grow it so you know they love it um on residential properties it kind of then escapes or however it gets into the park it does um, but that may be another area I'll take a look when I am um, checking bluebird boxes if there's any there. Yeah, that's a good tip. Let let us know. We would want to hit that um, at the end of Viking if it's creeping in the park. It, it's probably starting to put up its its flowers now, which really right. really identifies it. Any other questions or comments on this one? Miscanthus um, grass was one of the big uh, plants that the government was looking into when they were um, looking into biofuels because of all the biomass that is um, associated with the plant. So um, that's a little scary. <laughs> so I don't know where that's going, but um, there was a lot of talk about Miscanthus being a biofuel. What about... Uh... Pheasant habitat is that the species too? Not that I know of, but people do say that you know the pheasants will inhabit the areas that have a lot of miscanthus because it's good cover for them. Yeah, it's like a perfect house in there, but man, it's nothing grows under the ground. It's just a single clone. Basically. Yeah, single species. All right, so uh, we are progressing later into the summer into fall. Uh, and that's when we pick up with seed collection. And we're starting to see more and more species becoming ripe and ready to collect uh, earlier than normal for most of these species, dry, dry uh, ground, dry weather, things kind of speed up in their phenology. So here's Golan Alexander, um, the flowering, the blooming plant on the left kind of looks a little bit like parsnip same family the leaves are are very different though however take a look at the leaf difference not usually nearly as big and robust and tall and, and sturdy looking um, but that flower does look a little similar it's that umbel yellow um, and then this time of year it looks like what we have on the right um, those yellow flowers get pollinated and turn to these little seeds kind of look like little caraway seeds or uh, something in the um, carrot family. Um, and uh, right now they are ripe. In, in previous years, we've waited until the end of August, even early September, but with this dry weather, it's sped it all up. So 
Uh, we've had a couple of um, seed collection outings. Um, this would be an idea if you have a patch in your park that maybe you want to mix it up with your volunteers, uh, try something new, um, not always out there killing things every time they come out, but you could also be out there collecting things. Uh, like Mary was saying, it's nice to have a variety of things to do for, for school groups or OFS or whatever. So um, it's a core species in our plantings, both in prairies and open savannas. Um, it's an early bloomer, so shortly after burn season, maybe, um, you know, early May, you'll see this blooming prolifically um, in areas where it's where it's abundant, just yellow hillsides, like across from the Lucia Heritage Center. Um, this spring was just bright yellow uh, bumper crop of it. So um, interesting how some of our species have really suffered from the drought. It appears that at least at this site, across from the Heritage Center, it has done just fine and maybe even taken advantage of other people, other species suffering. Um, it's got more room to breathe and, and has really benefited from this dry weather. And the seed looks viable too. It doesn't look like it's all dust. So um, that is Golden Alexander. And then another one in this carrot family um, is Angelica. Uh, there has been a pretty good stand of it down at Stewart Lake County Park, uh, all throughout that Moen Creek wetland. Uh, I think we've collected a little bit in the past, but this one, um, it has these umbels of uh, flowers and seeds, but they're actually more globe-like. They're sort of a big sphere, or um, not just a flat umbel, but rounded on top, and it kind of continues like this big um, big ball or globe of, of seeds. Uh, when they are ripe, it kind of looks more like the picture on the right. They're, they're dry, they're gray. They kind of almost look like little um, slices of oatmeal seeds, uh, like a little oatmeal grain, and they'll pull off of that stem pretty easily. The stem itself is also pretty dry at this point. Um, but it's an early ripening species here in August. Um, it's really quick to fill up a, a collection bag, so you'll feel like you're really getting a lot done <laughs> by, by collecting this species. Um, it is kind of bizarre looking, especially in the growing season when it's blooming and has that big red stem. Um, it looks almost invasive, and I've had I've, people asked us, like, should I go cut this plant down? Um, it looks nasty. And is it giant hogweed or something that you've heard of in the scary horror stories? But it's not. It's uh, it's a good beneficial native wetland species, always close to the groundwater. Its feet are always pretty wet. Um, and it doesn't ever get to be badly behaved. It might have a cluster that's dense like this, um, but it won't be like this across the whole wetland. And I, I kind of like it because it gives some um, variety to the habitat, some complexity, some structure. So you have, you know, birds that'll perch on it and, you know, common yellow throat or whatever sing from the, the top stems and, and then they go down in the grass to their nest or whatever. So uh, kind of a neat plant. Uh, pollinators seem to like it a lot too. And if you, if you can find a lot of it out in your park, uh, another species to collect, not for short people, but but one you can uh, collect uh, nonetheless. The other one that's sort of similar to this, I don't have pictures. Also, yet another carrot family with the humble is the cow parsnip. Um, that one, Liz, we saw quite a bit at Donald along the creek corridor, Deer, Deer Creek, I think it is, um, Sutter. And that also tends to grow in um, wetter soils, not only wet soils, but usually wetter fertile soils. It's got more of a flat top to it, bigger sort of seeds that look kind of like wafers or little coins. And uh, caution with that one, though, is it can be phototoxic like parsnip, even though it's a good beneficial native, it can still burn you. So um, make sure uh, to wear gloves when collecting that one. 
Uh, right now when it's dry, I would imagine it's a little bit harder to get burned, but you never know. Um, so there's a few more species coming online, but these were two to three that we thought we should um, point out. Any questions on those species? So are you asking us to, to harvest from our parks um, and then get, get the seeds to you? Or are you asking us when you could schedule this as part of a bigger countywide? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we would take uh, any information from you, like if you had a really big crop of something, um, this goes for, you know, any, any discussion we have, you know, we, we could schedule a big uh, collection event or have seasonals or LFS go out and get it. Um, for these species at your parks, I'm going to guess, um, that it's not going to be enough for that, but it could be something that you collect, um, with your volunteers or independently. And, uh, especially in the case of Angelica, uh, we would really accept, we would really appreciate that. Um, the uh, Golden Alexanders, we have a pretty good crop already. We would always take more, um, but we don't, to my knowledge, have any Angelica. So if you if you are interested in doing that, like to do that kind of stuff and want to mix up your, your work a little bit so you're not just, um, you know, weeding or killing <laughs> like we do so much of, uh, this would be a good way to shake up, um, add some variety to, to what you're doing out there and maybe draw in some other people that might be interested in that. Okay, thanks. Any other questions on seeds? Otherwise, the only other section we have here is just general Q&A if you all have any anything else for us. Lars, I have a question. It, yeah, it Liz. seems every time I see you, I have a question about sumac. And so here's today's question. Yeah. Um, you know Donna Thomas, she's on our board and she works with us on a lot of Saturdays. And she works on her own property and consults with Mike Healy. And he uh recommended to her that she cut sumac um like three times during the summer and not and she didn't because she didn't want to apply herbicide she was afraid of harming you know collateral damage uh, was do you, do you feel that's the, an alternative for do you think herbicide is the better route yeah so to cut and treat, you're doing two things instead of one with just cutting. So you're going to have better results if you add herbicide. Um, however, if you're like Donna and you don't want to add herbicide, you don't want to deal with the hazard, collateral damage or whatever, um, you can just cut, but it's not going to be as speedy of a control um, compared to adding that herbicide in there. Uh, if you're, if you've got 20 acres of sumac and a big mower, well, that makes a lot of sense to just mow it three times because how are you going to go and individually treat every one of those stumps? Um, and maybe you don't want to foliar treat across that whole Bay area. So that would be a good solution. Um, however, I wouldn't say after three, mowings in one year, you can guarantee yourself that it's going to be gone. You're going to want to follow up that next year and just keep at it because it's got that big root system. And if you're not adding chemical, um, there's a very good chance you could be at it a couple of years. Okay. Yeah. And I guess I wouldn't want to go in by hand three times in the course of the summer after the same, the same group of plants. But when, you know, I'm I really want to get rid of that sumac that we've been working on for the last two years. Yeah. What 
can we, you know, go in there very in September, say, and be really careful and start looking for re-sprouts in the areas we've been in? Yeah, you just reminded me of something. Yeah, the dabbers. Yeah, we, we got these, uh, thinking of people like you and Jack, um, these are these buckthorn blasters. And um, one of our other volunteers recommended this thing. And it's very surgical. Um, so it comes in a little, little tube like this. It's got a cap and then it's got this applicator. It's like a little button on top. And then you can replace it and you just kind of squeeze and stamp it. You stamp the stems. And so this would be, you know, very surgical, um, slow work, but very low risk of collateral damage um, compared to, you know, any other application of herbicide. So if you want, I can put these out at Libby Road for getting out to volunteers. Maybe Jack, you want these for um, Stuart. Um, yeah, abso absolutely. Yeah. That'd be great. And Lars, you think those are better than the herbicide sticks that I've gotten from Prairie Enthusiasts? Yeah, I, I haven't used those ones from Prairie Enthusiasts. Um, the only you know benefit um, with this is you're down low, and you know that stick is quite a bit bigger. So I don't know. This might be a little bit handier to use um, if you go I also there. you can get smaller well I have um about four smaller sticks from prairie enthusiasts as well okay. yeah yeah we'll give them both a try okay sometimes it's just personal preference with that sort of stuff and um if those sticks work just fine I mean there's there's not much of a big long uh wick on there that's going to give you a lot of um, contact with other vegetation right it's pretty small like this like the tip on here yeah yes the only thing i do worry about is um it has a has an on off valve and i worry that it could drip mm -hmm. as you move from plant to plant that that made me wonder if those blasters were a little better in that sense right well shane and i are heading out today to run some errands so i think we'll put these in the um the libby road shed uh we'll, we'll put some in the cabinet just to the right as you walk in the libby road in that in that wooden cabinet um, we'll put them there with your guys' names on it and you can grab them and give them a test and see how you like them let us know how, how it goes okay um can you hear me yeah uh that's great i i that that's really good to hear um can i get uh can i get three or four or yeah we got we got a bunch of them here um and then we can always buy more they're not that expensive yeah we have um the goat squad will get going again here in a few weeks so um it'd be great if i could pick those up yeah yeah absolutely we'll yeah thank you yeah. thank you i when you're ready i had whenever uh i uh, i have some questions yeah but, go ahead go uh, ahead Jack. yes yes go ahead okay i'm gonna uh, i three three kind of uh weed questions one one's an aggressive a uh, native um can you just uh the three are uh mullion uh um reed canary grass and then uh canada golden uh goldenrod which is, is a a native um but it can get pretty aggressive um can we start with mullion um can you talk about that that plant please in the in the other prairie i'm i'm kind of working on is is the prairie opening and it's horrible. There, there is so much of it, um, and I learned some lessons with it too. Um, can you just talk about that plant in general, please? 
Yeah, so mullein is um, the very velvety uh, plant. People have called it uh, poor, poor man's toilet paper is one nickname that, <laughs> that I've heard. And uh, it's extremely velvety. It's got basil leaves and then it shoots up that stalk, very thick stalk of yellow flowers. And then um, <clears throat> those get pollinated, a bunch of little seeds come out. It's a biennial. <clears throat> this is probably the easiest of the three, Jack, because my recommendation is don't even worry about it. <laughs> uh, it goes away on its own. It comes in after you've opened the ground. Um, disturbance, you know, it, it may never show up again or, you know, maybe in 30 years if there's uh, some ground disturbance, it comes back. But um, you can mow it off when it's flowering if you don't like the look of it. Um, but really, it just kind of goes away on its own. Okay. Yeah. The, good, uh, that, that, that's good to hear. Can we talk about reed canary grass? Yeah, that's that's a that's a lot longer of a uh, discussion. Um, uh, but I, I just wanted to mention with that before it is I met I think I mentioned to you, you know, we I see it. I, I think the given the topography here is that we see it along residential boundary lines and with people either watering lawns or run off from the streets into the basins um there's just stands of it but it, it tends to be in those areas because i assume that runoff and groundwater movement um it's just wetter it tends to be wetter in those areas and that's where we see it mm -hmm. is that something in the long run we need to be concerned about your your comments on that please um you know it, it'll grow in those wet areas it certainly likes the wet but it'll grow you know unirrigated as well right. in uplands and we definitely got examples um throughout the park system where it's it's in a fairly dry soil it's not as happy in those dry soils and it's always easier to kill in those drier soils it's really at home in the wetlands um you know this is one that it's entrenched in our landscape it's widespread it was planted for marsh hay it loves um disturbance stormwater uh sedimentation you know it, we've really created a pretty ideal landscape for for reed canary grass and unlike some of these other species, the miscanthus, the phragmites, the knotweed that are just getting a toehold. Um, it's been here a long time and it, it's, you know, here to stay. So, you know, you can manage it, you can discourage it, you can probably almost eradicate it from certain sites if it's small enough, um, but you really need to be committed um, to, to following up. It's not just uh, one and done. You've got to, you know, hit it several times over a couple of years, um, shorter if you're in drier areas, but it's still going to be um, hard to get rid of. So, you know, there's, there's herbicides that'll work on it. Um, there's um, fire that helps and complements your herbicide. Um, you know, there's mowing, you can do a lot of stuff to beat up, beat up on it, but the, the key, um, is, is to be persistent on it and, um, and how you approach it, uh, probably depends a little bit on, um, the context of your site. Are you talking about a dry site, a wet site? Do you have desirable vegetation around, um, or is it all just, just all weeds where you can be a little bit, um, more aggressive in your approach because you don't have to worry about collateral damage. Okay, that, that, thanks, that's, that's helpful. There's just one area that um, I'd like to deal with. So it, it's not very big at this point. Um, mm. um, the other, the other the, moving to the remnant as we move into the fall, um, Canada mm. goldenrod in the remnant, um, I tend to see, see it in different areas and um your thoughts on 
on that and controlling that um, in the remnant? You know, Canada goldenrod in a remnant situation, it's probably not going to be too big of a problem, uh, especially your very, very dry southwest facing remnant. Um, it's it's more at home in your mesic soils, your heavier soils, fertile areas, good moisture. Um, you know, it can really um, push its weight around in those kind of settings. But in a very dry site like that, I, I wouldn't even worry about it. I mean, you can you can mow it if you want, but you know. I just don't think you're going to see dominance of goldenrod in, in that kind of dry, dry environment. Um, you know, in, in the areas where it is happy, it's a real pain, um, but it also does have big boom in bust years. Um, we've seen sites where the prairie looks like it's solid Canada goldenrod one year in, in a very, you know, nice mesic site where it would be happy and you think you've lost the prairie to Canada goldenrod because here it is so abundant in an area that it's you know very adapted to but then the next year it kind of fades out a little bit and you don't see it as bad for a couple of years and then it comes back so <clears throat> you know it's hard to say being that it's a native um i we don't prioritize it at all um it's integrated in our flora it's it's a native and, and, and should be there to a certain extent um if you want to try to discourage it i mean you you can mow it a few times a year mow it while it's in flower try to hurt it um you can treat patches of it um but you know typically we don't have the luxury um to really worry too much about Canada goldenrod, given all the other challenges that, that we have. So I don't know if that's helpful or not. Um, yeah, that's, kinda... that's spot on. I mean, I, I have, a, we have enough to do at the remnant. So um, perfect. Um, we'll just, I'll keep an eye on it and um, we'll, we will get to many other things we need to deal with. Yeah. Mary, did you have a question earlier? Yeah. I just wanted I wanted to ask about um, at what point it makes sense for us to collect and then kind of redistribute our um, bottle brush grass uh, into within the uh, savanna. Like I don't and and we you know we have the Canada golden rot or the Can Canada wild rye and Virginia wild rye too. So we're we're thinking that this year we'll we'll keep that stuff on site. We unless you unless you want to come and get some of the bottle brush grass, but can we can we like uh right as soon as it kind of starts to dry, can we can we pull it and and redistribute it or what when do we when do we do that? Yeah, so I guess backing up, um, you were saying earlier, like you really want good soil contact with your seeds. And I agree with that. Um, you really, you want to get those seeds down so they hit the soil and then they're going to be happy going into the fall. They'll settle into the profile with the frost action and then they'll be able to germinate next spring. So the challenge we have with our, our oak uh, environments is that that oak litter creates a pretty good barrier for seeds to find that that soil in, in theory uh, when it's really thick oak litter too so you know best case scenario you're able to seed that um, seed that uh, bottle brush grass onto the bare ground and then away you go just like um just like our prairies that we plant from ag fields. Um, now, you know, if you could get a, a fall burn on that oak litter and get it gone, you could rake it and get it gone, you leaf, know, blow it. leaf blow it and get it gone, whatever you have to do to get it gone so that you can get that contact. 
um, they're they're going to be the happiest. However, the fall burn and oak woodland is challenging, and leaf blowing and raking you can do. Maybe you have a big group that does that, but that is a lot of work. It's a very energy intensive um, work. Um, if you if you want to to uh, to do that, go for it. But if if you just think that's just too much. Well then, yeah, I, I would say seeding before the leaf drop is a pretty decent um, option, uh, especially at Stewart where leaf litter has always been a little bit of a challenge for us having enough leaf litter to burn. Um, we've always wanted to have more and it just seems like it's always a little sparse. So if you seed it right before the leaf drop, then, um, you know, uh, there's probably still going to be gaps and spaces in between those leaves where it can germinate the next spring. Unfortunate, unfortunate for our fire, but fortunate for the for the um, bottle brush grass, it will probably find those gaps. Um, if you're going to have gaps, well, then maybe it doesn't matter if you seed it after leaf drop because they'll probably blow around and find their way in between those gaps just the same. Um, so maybe at Stewart, it really doesn't matter. You could do before or after, or you could, um, do some leaf blowing or raking, uh, or maybe you want to focus leaf blowing and raking in certain targeted areas and not do the whole woods. It's a lot of work. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that was helpful at all, um, uh, but though, that's my thought process there on that. And how do we know, sorry, our old uh, house phone is ringing right now. It means the Democratic National Committee is looking for money. Um, <laughs> but we, um, we're, how do you know the seed is, the, gra the grass seed is ready? Oh, yeah. So Shane just, I think, was doing his motion. <laughs> If it pulls right off, um, okay. No rush grass, especially, it's ready. Um, you know, you can see the little dangly anthers, the flower parts. Uh, maybe those are still on right now, um, but typically it's like late August, and it's just you touch the plant, and it's like the 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 seeds shatter because it's dry. The plants dry. Those anthers are gone, and they just peel right off, like effortlessly they just peel right off of that stem so um that one's actually a pretty easy one to tell okay we we have plenty of um open ground uh in part because like uh when the the wood pile was was broken down you know we've got a lot of uh like tire marks through there or whatever track marks that are that just open soil um and where uh herbicide was applied. where herbicide was applied uh you know to go we had such bad dams rocket we've got we've got plenty of open ground i just wanted to make sure that i wasn't timing yeah that the timing was right so that's really yeah. helpful thanks you no know, it's a it's a good um good general tip just to sort of do what nature does and not try to do something radically different like planting in the spring. So if nature is dropping seeds this time of year, that's probably a reason and it's evolved that way and it's gonna be the happiest that way. So when, when in doubt, you just kind of think what's what's nature doing with these seeds or with, you know, think of any question really <laughs> um, out there. Uh, just let it drop when nature would drop it. And it's it's probably for good reason. And it's probably going to be the happiest. Um, I, I get I kind of go a little crazy with people doing spring plantings of seeds and they collect all these seeds and they they put them in um, uh, paper towels and wet them or, or dry them and put them in the freezer. And then they set their timer for 30 days or 60 days. And <laughs> I'm, I'm not talking about planting plants. <laughs> I'm talking about people that do that with prairie seeding restorations. If you're doing, if you're planting plants, go ahead and do that. But if you're doing a seeding, why would you go through all that extreme, extreme effort? 
to seed a prairie in the spring by taking seed in and out of your freezer and refrigerator and, and damp paper towels or whatever, and then go yeah. and scatter the seeds in the spring, just do what nature does and plant it in the fall. So if you're planting plants, Mary, that's that's the right thing to do because nature isn't gonna plant a plug in a tray for you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, good, thanks. Can I throw in Jack's two cents? Yeah. Wow, I think that's such great advice. Nature is our greatest teacher. Um, um, I think the win-win-win here is, is wow, timing into August or so of getting seed. It's ready. There's a lot of bare ground there. I walk, uh, as Mary just said, for all different reasons. You get the seed on the ground. Uh, by September, late September, October, the leaf litter falls. That's like nature at work. Um, hopefully we get more leaf litter. Um, that adds nutrients to the soil. That's what nature does. And then the other win is we have leaf litter and you that'll help facilitate a burn um, if we do a spring burn. So thank you, Laura. Is that sounds like the I don't know to me the perfect way to go um raking and and leaf blowing it just seems really unnatural to me mm -hmm. um unless like you said I think you said unless there's a really targeted area so um nature is the best so thank you well said I think too that even if you do have a light layer of leaves you know with the wind rattling the leaves, you know, that they, they'll make their way to the seat or to the soil for, um, you know, the frost to, to uh, work, work the seed into the ground. But when you are talking a, a thick layer, you know, something that maybe has had, uh, you know, leaves falling on it for years, that, that seed is definitely a lot uh, more difficult to get to the ground in that situation. Yeah, we, we don't have, I don't think we'd like, we don't have that situation. So... <laughs> Um, I mean, it is what it is. So I think it provides just some really nice opportunities for us. Right. And grab some of that golden Alexander if you got it up in your prairie and throw it, throw it in there with that bottle brush and see if we can get some of that to grow in your, your woodlands while you're at it too. Uh, you know, that's a good thing to, I'm glad you brought up golden Alexander because when, when I walked through the prairie checking bluebird boxes and it's near in the end, there was a lot of golden Alexander there. So I think I'll take my time next time I do it um, and um, collect, collect some, some seed is it, how long, we, how long do we have to collect golden Alexander seed? Yeah. So that one, um, you know, with a strong storm, Yep. Uh, the raindrops will rattle off those seeds um, in a lot of cases. So I wouldn't wait too long uh -huh. on that one. If, if it's dry, if the, if the seed is dry and no longer kind of succulent anymore, then I would try to prioritize getting it because, you know, a strong storm can knock them off. One, one thing that I, I've been seeing across the park system is a very wide range of ripeness as well. Of that seed. Uh, three weeks ago, two weeks ago, we collected some golden Alexander, and some of it was dry as a bone, ready to harvest, and some of it was still green. Monday, we collected. We had lots of it that was really dry, but some of it was still green or purple and had a lot of moisture to it yet. Um, and then I saw a bunch yesterday out at Walking Iron that was it was all purple almost, and and not not dry, none of it was hardly dry at all. So um you know you might have a longer than you think or you might have a shorter period of time to think to get that seed because some places it's already falling off some places it's not quite ready so um take a look see what you got going you know, one other thing on that bottle brush grass there mary um you guys really have a bumper crop of it like i've never seen before in that area nice yeah um i would uh i would say if you want to make sure to get that spread across the big area you're gonna probably want to actually maybe dilute it with some um some chaff 
Um, otherwise, you're going to be throwing out a lot all in one area. Um, so I don't know if we have chaff, but we could certainly get you some chaff or some mulch, wood mulch, or I'm sorry, uh, wood shavings um, to help, you know, to dilute it a little bit so that if you have volunteers that are helping to broadcast that in August um, or September, that they they don't throw out, you know, a handful of a thousand seeds all in one little spot. You can kind of have them scattered across a wider area because you do have such a nice crop there. I'd hate for it to get too concentrated, you know, in, in some places, you know. So let's let's talk later if you want some chaff or some shavings. Any other questions? It's 1030 right now, so we should probably be wrapping up. Um, as always, um, Shane and I are always willing to take your questions at any time. Just give us a call or an email, and um, we are happy to work with you. Appreciate everything you all are doing. Uh, Stuart, today you all were on the stage, and... Um, uh, I just am so happy with all the work that you guys do out there. It, you should be really proud. It's just amazing what's going on at that park. Um, so uh, thanks for coming today and sharing with us um, uh, your work out there. And then Liz, thanks for coming today and uh, representing Donald and all the fine work that you're starting out there. And uh, maybe you all can trade notes because you're so close to each other in the neighborhood there. So. Yeah, well, thank you, Lars. Thank you, Shane. All right, I'm going to try to press stop record here. Oh, stop share. And then stop recording.